nonviolence is sometimes referred to as love in action. How do you understand love? Wow, I wish I could say that I do understand it better. But, of course, I have some understanding of it, as we all do. The more you work with nonviolence, the more you realize that it is practically identical with love when love is well understood. Uh, what you're dealing with in love is the most powerful force in the universe. It probably has all the self-organizing properties that we want to develop a new world. Love is a precious skill. The same statement could be made of nonviolence. There's a statement in the Bhagavad Gita that yoga or meditation is skill in action. And uh, that very well defines also an aspect of what we mean by love. For me, I think for most nonviolence practitioners, the most important first step is love is way beyond and perhaps not even identical with the sentiment, the emotion that we usually uh, connect with that word. And I think uh, Hollywood has done us a disservice, you know. Love is not something that you, quote, fall into the way you fall into an open manhole. Love requires a great deal of self-struggle. When uh, Gandhi's wife was once asked, how many children do you have? She said, well, it depends whom you ask. I have four. He has 400 million. In other words, that Gandhi's love for the entire population of India was as great, as intense, as personal, as her love was for the four children that uh, she had borne through her own body. An important way of thinking about love for us is that love arises from the awareness of unity. It arises from the awareness that I cannot possibly benefit from hurting another person. So here's where you begin to see that love and nonviolence are practically indistinguishable. Gandhi said that there is a force which keeps this universe of ours from flying apart, and without that force, it, we would fly into atoms in a second. And the name of that force on the physical plane is gravity. But that force also operates on the human plane. And it, on that level, it's called love. So there's at least a powerful analogy, if not different aspect of the same thing, that the, the attractive force among objects, which is called gravity, is parallel to the attractive force among creatures, which is called love. But attraction doesn't necessarily mean physical attraction in this case. What it means is when you are spontaneously aware of the welfare of the other party, in this case, in the other person. So when you've reached the point where that other person's welfare is more important to you than your own, you are in love with that person and not before then. And you can see what a wonderful mechanism this is for helping us reduce our own egotism. Because if, if you practice what my spiritual teacher called putting others first and not putting yourself first, you're forgetting about your own personal separative needs in the welfare of other people. And all your ambition to help the world can be directed outwards at others, not at gratifying yourself, which liberates you from the clutches of the mass media and all that commercialism. Now, the difficulty with what I'm calling the Hollywood concept of love is that it's so limited. You can only love maybe one or a few people at a time, and even there, you can't love the whole person, right? It's really, if you suddenly don't like their smile or something like that, you, quote, fall out of love with them, it's all tangled up with their physical appearance, which, of course, is changing drastically all the time. It never stops. It's never the same for an instant. But when you love another person spiritually, meaning when you want their welfare more than you want your own, when you reach the point where you're willing to sacrifice for the welfare of another person, it leads to great growth for yourself spiritually, and it leads to your introducing this energy of unity, what Kenneth Boulding called integrative power, into the world. And when that integrative power when that vision of unity runs into opposition and when you find you have to struggle not against another person, but against the project of another person, then your love has become love in action. And that's what we typically refer to 
as nonviolence. So true love will, among other things, lead to a great deal of skill in communication, and our friends who practice nonviolent communication be very good at explaining this, because you will begin to understand intuitively what the other person really wants. And it will enable you sometimes to give them resistance because you want to do your bit to prevent them from doing something that will harm themselves. So love is not a popularity contest. It is an engagement with the other which enables you to forget your own welfare in the context of the welfare of the whole. And practically everything that I've said so far is identical with nonviolence. The only thing I would like to add, and I don't think this will be different either, is that ultimately, and I, I would never have realized this if it weren't for my spiritual teacher, ultimately the goal that we have is not to love X number of people or Y number of people, but to become love itself, which means that you become a channel, if you will, for that creative force of the universe, which has brought us into existence and which will bring us into a much richer existence if we learn how to cooperate with it. I wonder if I've really done this wonderful subject justice, but at least I think these may be some useful guidelines. Thank you.